Everybody, welcome. Wow. A little louder than I thought. I'm Andrea Mitchell from NBC News and MSNBC. And it is such a great pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Aspen Institute and Aspen Ideas to be here having this conversation with one of my heroes, Ambassador Samantha Power. Our former ambassador to the United Nations, a Pulitzer Prize winner for her landmark book, A Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide, which also won the National Book Critics Award after her extraordinary reportage on the Bosnia War, now on the joint faculty of the Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School at Harvard. She is very busy writing her memoir entitled The Education of an Idealist, which I think is a great note on which to begin. Tell me, what is the education of an idealist, and how would you define idealist? Because we need a little more idealism, I think, these days. We do, we do. Well, first, thank you for being here. Thank you all for staying uh, in this hot tent. Thank you, Walter, for your decades of leadership and your humanity, which just oozes through every pore and every one of these sessions. Um, I, I guess, First of all, I should say that I've, I've never used the first person in my writing at all, and in therapy, even have trouble using the first person. So the thought of writing anything personal in a memoir is uh, anathema, and this is why I'm in Aspen instead of at my computer. Um, but what, what this, the arc, I guess, of having been an outside critic of US foreign policy and then going into the room where it happens, the room where it happens, um, you know, went from being in the room and literally experiencing the equivalent of an intruder alert in my brain, feeling as if I didn't belong there because I'd spent so many years like you interviewing people to try to find out what these discussions were like. Um, and then, of course, having to defend policies that sometimes weren't my favorite, um, uh, defending things I very much believed in, uh, like our leadership on Ebola, on ISIL, and other things. Um, but. I think when you hear the education of an idealist, it's a little misleading. There's the old expression, a conservative is a liberal who's been mugged by reality. That is not my experience of government. I left government wiser, certainly, uh, more alert, I think, to the uh, form that the constraints took. But I went into government very aware that one is constrained in trying to alleviate alleviate human suffering abroad. So I'd say just a, a few of the lessons. I mean, I think what I would have underestimated before was bandwidth as a problem. I mean, when we went all in on securing the Iran nuclear deal, there was a real effect of that diplomatic bandwidth getting gobbled up over so many months on our ability to sit on the Syria problem. It just is the case that there was one Secretary of State and I would stress that, uh, you know, I think the current administration, the, the, the indispensability of filling these diplomatic posts, uh, you know, on paper it's an issue to have so many vacancies, but when you think about your inability to put high-level people who can actually convene high-level people from other countries who can actually make decisions, there's just practical reasons to get these positions filled so you can task people. I think human dignity is totally underestimated and, and national dignity is underestimated as a force in foreign policy. The, the mileage and the points I got for such little gestures when I was ambassador to the UN, like I, I decided I was gonna visit every one of the other 192 missions of the UN. Um, and in showing up, I'd say 50, 60 of them were missions that had never been visited by the American ambassador in the history of the United Nations or in the history of a small country. When I then go to that country and ask them to stand with us in rejecting Russia's annexation of Crimea, they remember, Central African Republic remembers, you know, that the American ambassador showed up. I was, this is not broadly known, but I will confess it here, I was in a band uh, while I was at the UN called UN Rocks. Uh, <laughs> And the Korean was the drummer, the Korean ambassador. The Togolese ambassador was, played the keyboard. And the Thai, the Serb, 
uh, and the Papua New Guinean uh, also played guitars, and, and, the, and the Danish ambassador played guitars, God, he'd kill me, uh, electric guitar and bass, and I was the lead singer. Now, my voice didn't sound like it sounded today, but it didn't sound much better. So if you want a testament to American soft power, it is that we have so much power that they would tolerate a lead singer like me just to have America in the band. But in doing that and in being prepared to be vulnerable and sort of occasionally humiliate myself, I think then again, when you show up and you want help on LGBT rights, which had no business making progress at the UN, given how many countries have retrograde laws, you know, criminalizing homosexuality, you had countries who, were, who wanted to do what we wanted. You know, they, it didn't mean they could, but they were gonna look with me to figure out what kind of procedural loophole could we find that would allow them to find some other way to justify doing a progressive thing that wasn't about changing their country's laws back home, which they were not empowered to do. So dignity, 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 and bandwidth, and the importance of not overestimating America's leverage, right, which some do, I think, thinking you just snap your fingers, and if we only wanted it more, there'd be a serious solution. But also what I think is more pervasive is underestimating the leverage we have. Because when we put our minds to it, and I saw it at the UN just time and again when I was empowered to go forth and mobilize countries, I saw it in every Security Council meeting on everything from Burundi to North Korea, that, you know, other ambassadors would leave after I would speak. They just wanted to report to their capital what the United States' position was on a given day. So I learned a lot. Um, I certainly learned about humility also in, in tackling a lot of these crises, but I, I feel much more idealistic on the back end of eight long years in government uh, than I even did going in. I, I was very struck by the personal touch to your diplomacy. Reading about how you reacted when Vitaly Cherkin, the Russian ambassador to the UN, died suddenly, and you paid tribute to him as my friend Vitaly, a diplomatic maestro, for which you were slammed on Twitter, uh, because he's shocking. Russian, shocking. Uh, tell me about friendships across those divides. Well, I mean, I think it, it is surprising to people, given the clashes that I had with the Russian ambassador, which were not only very heated, not only very visible, not only very venomous at times, um, but they were completely heartfelt in the sense that they were about Aleppo. They were about Ukraine and, you know, lopping off part of a neighbor. So it is surprising to people that he was not only my closest colleague, but my closest friend uh, as ambassador to the UN. He's the only ambassador I brought to my parents' home for Thanksgiving, as one example. He and his wife were friends with my, my husband, Cass, and myself. Um, and he had a, a depth of character uh, that I was able to see, notwithstanding the fact that he was Vladimir Putin's representative uh, at the United Nations. Part, I think if he was merely funny and soulful and, you know, culturally curious and, you know, a lot of things you'd like in a friend, but still was articulating these reprehensible positions, I, I don't think I could have had the kind of friendship I had in the period that we coincided in New York. Maybe in the 90s, you know, there, there wasn't that much friction in the relationship. But I think what made it possible was after so many of our heated Security Council clashes, sometimes I'd have to cool off, being Irish, you know, for a day or two, uh, but I would reach out to him and we would together try to get named Syrian political prisoners out of Assad's jails. Or we would we work together, of course, on the chemical weapons destruction effort. That was something he was very proud of. He was horrified by the use of chlorine, which was uh, Assad's first example of trying to, uh, you know, continue to use chemical weapons, basically. And we came up with an investigative mechanism. We, weirdly, there was a gap in the international system that there was no body tasked with looking into who used chemical weapons. It's kind of crazy. So he and I together invented that at the Security Council in the hopes that it would be a deterrent. He never admitted that Assad's government used chemical weapons. It was maddening, but we built the mechanism. And whether it had a footstep effect, I think, you know, different people uh, and a deterrent effect, uh, people can disagree. But I think certainly chlorine use dropped pretty precipitously and then, of course, started to tick back up when people realized there'd be no consequences. Um, but the point is, he always was willing to try, even if we couldn't solve the entire problem, and Syria was certainly bigger than he or I, and our leaders had their own views, 
Uh, but it, could we hive off part of the problem? Could we get more food to besieged areas? Like that, that, that animated him. And with that, plus just you know human chemistry, I think we were able to sort of wring some water out of the stone, if I can put it that way. And it's very modest compared to the calamity and catastrophe that is Syria. But if he hadn't been in New York, and maybe, maybe you know, I don't know if other American ambassadors would, would have approached things the same way. I mean, you have to hold your nose, you know, to do that kind of diplomacy. But if he hadn't been there, if he had quit, right, which is what probably going into my job I would have wished he would have done, right, you know, to show Putin, then, you know, we wouldn't have created the things that we created together. Maybe we wouldn't have the North Korea sanctions package that we were able to pass the toughest piece package of sanctions. And I negotiated, it was the tough, toughest in, in, you know, 20 something years uh, coming out of the UN. He could become an advocate for things that we, sec we secured in New York back to Moscow. And that was really important. So I think, you know, the cause of peace and security weirdly will miss a person who was the face of, frankly, trampling peace and security. But that's life, it's complicated, <laughs> very complicated. You speak of Syria. I was going to ask you about highs and lows. I suspect that the low would be the Syrian conflict. If there's criticism about a lack of process now in the national security team, there is criticism of the Obama team for being perhaps too legalistic and too bureaucratic. Respond. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that um, it mattered greatly to President Obama whether we had an international legal basis to use military force. It mattered when we used drones against terrorist targets and he, we developed an elaborate legal rationale. And it mattered when we were about to use force against the Assad regime. Uh, we came out and articulated what you might call an untraditional international legal basis, invoking the Chemical Weapons Convention and so forth. But the problem with law in the era of Vladimir Putin is that international law turns on being able to get Security Council authorization for the use of force, or for you to use force in self-defense, which is largely unobjectionable. And Vladimir Putin is himself trampling international law around the world and not likely to provide the United States with authorization to stop him or his proxies from doing so. So that's a structural tension that we ran into head on when we were prepared to use force initially after the chemical weapons use in August 2013. So I think that this is a major problem, a structural deformity in international law today that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, uh, maybe you could even say, others certainly would say Donald Trump are the arbiters of what's legal. That's an issue. And so I think it's fair to ask whether or not, you know, our administration's um, respect for adherence to faithfulness to uh, international law or attempt to be faithful to it is anachronistic in light of the rise of Putin and how international law gets defined. I think that what breaks my heart about Syria, in addition to just every day, any story you read about a Syrian family, um, is what I think the New York Times recently described as the Syrianization of the world, right? I mean, you know, you can't, we'll never know, but had we found a way, and I have no, you know, I had no silver bullet throughout, President Obama was always very eager to hear solutions that sounded credible and executable, um, and where the, it, it felt as though the, the, the benefits would outweigh the costs of the particular tool in, in play, and nothing we uh, argued about or, or lobbied for ever crossed that threshold for him beyond the things that you've seen us do. But, but what's crushing is to look and see how having now 66 million displaced people in the world, a third of whom are Syrian, um, how that affected the British decision making on Brexit. You know, how fear of refugees may even have been a factor in our election in a sense of two, two viewpoints, in the sense of the kind of horde of uncontrollable migration happening, not only of course from Syria, but also from North Africa and elsewhere. So I think it's hard to say that the Syria issue has not played a major role in the resurgence of terrorism and ISIL, uh, the heartbreak of millions of families and, and more sort of psychic numbing around humanitarian suffering 
uh, than we had experienced, you know, in many, I think, generations. I mean, Rwanda was the last kind of calamity of this magnitude, but it was over in 100 days. We're also used to seeing barrel bombs and chemical weapons use and refugee flow, and that dulls the senses and our expectations for how we treat one another and how we act as a, as a great nation. So I think the costs are going to be felt for a long time to come. That doesn't, therefore, follow, as some would, would argue, that you know, had we just followed Samantha's three-point plan or John McCain's three-point plan, you know, that we'd be in a different place. We could be in exactly the same place, but bogged down with ground troops and God knows what else. Uh, but it's, it's hard to imagine a worse set of consequences than where we are today. And when we talk about the refugees in the camps, uh, primarily in Jordan, Turkey, and neighboring countries, um, there is such an elaborate interviewing process by the UNHCR. I just want to put that out there because it's not as though these Syrian refugees, which as I read the Supreme Court's recent decision, these are the people who will have no relationships, no school uh, applications. They will have no jobs waiting for them, so none of these people will have any entry op opportunities under this at least 90-day period. But the vetting that goes on is more than extreme. It's, it's 18 months to two years. Yeah, I mean, I was intimately involved in actually revamping the vetting in our first term uh, with a desire to really ratchet it up. We, we made a commitment in the campaign to let in far more Iraqi refugees than the Bush administration had done. We felt we had a responsibility, even though it wasn't a war that we had prosecuted in the first instance. And we got our numbers way up to 25,000 Iraqis a year, but not before really trying to iron out, you know, any of the, the gaps that one could find. And, you know, our vetting process, it's UNHCR does its thing, but we would never rely on the UN, you know, as our security guardians. We have a, a process that, that's the, uh, the Counterterrorism Center, the FBI, the CIA, any NSA data, you know, in terms of phone connections between potential refugees, um, you know, any FIB, you know, even one that is related to health or how long you lived in a place, you're done, you're out, you know, and, and we have a lot of means for, for double checking and triple checking. So it's no accident that our process for letting a refugee into this country, the process to get clearance, takes nearly 36 months. Uh, and that's torture, as you can imagine, for a refugee family that's lying in wait, not knowing how their status is going to be adjudicated. But it is what has left us feeling very secure, it left us, the prior administration, I should say, representing to the American people that we can achieve both our objectives at once. Our first and foremost objective of keeping the American people safe, but also leading the world in uh, taking our share of what is the largest refugee burden since World War II. And when we shrivel up and try to build walls and, and, and shut this program down, specifically for Syrian refugees or for Muslim refugees fleeing present-day uh, nightmarish situations, all that does is give every other country with risk-averse pockets of their population or even majorities or pluralities of their population the excuse to do the same. So we're leading, even when we're, you know, you could say we're not leading on refugees anymore. No, we're leading. Believe me, we're leading. And you will see a cascade uh, in terms of people using this as a justification. You know, America, we're going to lead for the time, but, you know, for the next decade, no matter how we choose to use that leadership. And this is an example of using it in a manner that is going to have exponential effects on the number of Syrians that can be uh, uh, resettled. But if I may just, what, what we don't do when we, when we apply, let's call it the precautionary principle, you know, of trying to basically guarantee no risk whatsoever, because you can never eliminate risk if you're letting, you know, anybody in from any country. So if we apply the precautionary principle and try to eliminate risk, what we don't factor into that is what is the risk of letting these, you know, again, an exponential number of Syrian refugees remain inside Syria, potentially getting radicalized, or overburdening Jordan, Lebanon, countries whose stability really matters to us, Turkey, you know, which had been so generous for so long and now is in cer certain parts of the border areas shooting people who are coming across the border because they have no outlet strategy, they have no place then for these refugees to move on to. So what are the costs to our interests of the radicalization and the instability uh, and the extremism that gets brewed 
by there being no outlet. I mean, and that, that has to be part of our calculus. And that's why you see people in the military, you know, kind of mumbling about the executive order and behind the scenes being very open that they think it's, it's you know, bad for our national security, all things considered. But in a sound bite, if it's just a question, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, do you want to keep a certain population out? People are like, eh, well, maybe just keep them out just to be safe. But then they don't think about, are we making ourselves less safe over time in light of what we're, you know, what we're doing in the region and, and what we show of ourselves to the world? There's, there's been a definite de-emphasis on human rights and gender rights. Not in rights. the Cuba speech, not in the Cuba speech. Uh, Suddenly, <laughs> it was all about human rights. Which, in, in, in other aspects of our foreign policy, yeah. when it comes to China and other countries. And in a major speech to the workforce at the State Department, Secretary Tillerson said, if we condition too heavily that others must adopt this value that we've come to after a long history of our own, it really creates obstacles to our ability to advance our national security interests, our economic interests. To which you tweeted at the time, brutal thugs are smiling, human rights are not only US values, they are universal. Uh, what is the impact of de-emphasizing human rights in our foreign policy? Well, first let me say that there are a set of very fair questions to ask about how you balance a range of equities in any given day of foreign policy or any given encounter. And it's hard. I mean, you know, talking to an African leader about LGBT rights is no fun for our ambassadors around the world. Like, that's not their favorite thing to go and do, even if they believe they should, <clears throat> because, you know, criminalizing same-sex uh, relationships is cruel and inhumane and in violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, similarly, talking to the Saudi ambassador about women's rights and, you know, voting and driving and is, is no fun, and it's something they're likely not to heed in any immediate sense. But it is the case that our soft power has derived from many things, including, you know, Broadway musicals like Hamilton and our culture and our sports and all the rest, but it also has derived from peoples around the world, not governments, we're never thrilled uh, about this. I mean, even on the refugee and migration stuff, we had to talk to European governments about closing their borders to the, to the flow of people. So even raising human rights with your closest allies who share your values is not fun and not necessarily impactful in the moment. But it is a part of what people who are oppressed or who just don't feel their voices are being heard, what they have counted on the United States uh, for doing, and they've even counted on us doing it in hypocritical ways. I mean, no one has ever been perfect in the way that they have chosen to preach the gospel of human rights who's led the United States. We weren't, you know, certainly uh, we're seeing a very different version of it in this administration. So this administration is saying, in a way, like, hey, we're gonna be more honest, right? We're gonna just say that we're de-emphasizing it and it's not gonna be a factor, but they are going further than that in embracing people like Duterte, you know, in the Philippines, who is open about using force against, uh, you know, people he says are, are uh, drug users or involved in the drug trade, but who have no due process and are just being mowed down in the streets. He op has been open in the past, not so much recently, about his affection for, respect for Vladimir Putin. So that's not merely, you know, choosing to balance the variables in a different way. And yet, one can be struck that when we intervened in Syria after the chemical weapons attack and bombed you know, the, uh, facilities involved in murdering civilians, that the language was the language of human rights and about children who shouldn't be killed by their government. When we tried to reverse some of the steps on the Cuba normalization process that we had unleashed, again, last week or whenever that was, the language was all about human rights in Cuba. Now, what won't work is to give speeches about de-emphasizing and, and other speeches about embracing, you know, bloody leaders and then turning around and invoking humor. I mean, that that just, even by the standards of, what is it, the, the tribute that, that uh, the vice plays, or what is the thing about hypocrisy? Anyway, you know, that, that we, 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 nobody has been perfect in being fully consistent on human rights, and, and we weren't either. But there's, there's a way of doing it now uh, where it's so clear that this has been uh, put to one side, uh, 
And you know, people could get used to that. It would be a great shame for all those people out there who count on us, but they could get used to that. But what they will never get used to is overtly de-emphasizing it or saying it doesn't matter and then turning around and invoking it as your rationale. That can't work. And you've paid a great deal of attention to cultural diplomacy. As being in New York, you took other ambassadors to see Hamilton and other Broadway shows. You made great use of this. It strikes me that um, there are cultural treasures in our country. Big thinkers, big authors, people who have written about Ben Franklin, oh, about mm. Albert Einstein, even about Da Vinci. Yeah. People, let's say, like... Not many people, though. Well, Not maybe so many. One. Maybe one. Maybe, maybe Walter one Isaacson. Maybe one. 